Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Home. What exactly is it? What's its relationship to place, to people, to objects, and how should we respond to its importance in our lives? Good evening, I'm Sarah Fine. I'm a senior lecturer in philosophy at King's College London, and I'm a fellow here at the Forum. And I'm delighted to introduce our wonderful panel for this evening. We're gonna be discussing the politics, poetry, and philosophy of home. So on the end, we've got Dr. Karen Ine, who's a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University College Cork. And she's the author of the award-winning book, Global Justice and Territory, and the forthcoming book, A Philosophy of Territorial Borders. We have Yusuf M. Kasmier, who's a writer in residence for the AHRC ESRC funded Refugee Hosts Project. He's also Creative Encounters Editor for the Migration and Society Journal, and he's a doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford. And in the middle, we have Dr. Beth Watts, who's Senior Research Fellow at iSphere, Harriet Watt University. And among other things, Beth is on the editorial board of the journal Housing Studies, and she's a non-executive director for the Rock Trust, which is a Scottish youth homelessness charity. Welcome and thanks very much for coming tonight. So what I'm gonna do is pose a series of questions to our speakers and at various points in the evening, I'll open up to questions from you. And there's a roving mic to remind you, so please do wait until the mic arrives with you. All right, so our first question that I'd like to think about tonight is the deceptively simple one, what is home? And if you don't mind Beth, I'll start with you. No problem at all. Um, yes, deceptively simple, I think, is about right. I think the idea of home does belie easy description and summary. Uh, so I think at the most obvious level, uh, and very importantly, home is a physical shelter. It's a physical structure that protects us from the elements. Um, that's kind of the boring, easy answer, but I don't think we can forget how important it is. It's also um, material and physical in another sense. I think home is somewhere where we keep and collect and curate our stuff, our belongings. And I think um, there's something there about kind of meaning making and identity um, in the home, um, which I think takes us into territory where actually um, home is characterized by things that are less tangible, less, less physical. There's something here about um, how we can feel, how we do feel, and what we're able to do and be in a particular kind of a place. Uh, and I think these, so, uh, so I'll just mention a couple of aspects of home which I think are really important, and I think all of us know they're really important in our own lives, but maybe in other contexts, maybe when we're thinking about people who are experiencing homelessness, we kind of forget about these aspects of home. That's sort of one of the points I want to make tonight. Mm -hmm. So one of those aspects is home is where we um, make and forge and maintain and nurture relationships. So relationships with um, the people that we live with, our mother, our father, our sisters, our brothers, our children, our housemates. Um, it's where we do all that work of making and keeping friends and, and family members, um, but also other friendships outside of the home with, with friends, have your pals over, speak on Skype. I think that is a really important element of home. It's where we do that stuff. Um, I think home is also somewhere, I don't think we can get away from the fact, especially in the UK, speaking in somewhere like London, that for a lot of people, home is an asset. It's an, it's an economic mm. um, asset. Um, I'm not sure many people would say that was perhaps an, in an intrinsic part of home, but it is layered on top of it, I think, for a lot of people. Um, if you're a homeowner, it's your economic asset, but if you're a renter in the private or the social rented sector, you're living in someone else's kind of economic asset, and I think that's important in lots of ways. Um, Something I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about is home as somewhere where we have control and autonomy. It's a place where we, in part or in full, can kind of make the rules. And I think that that's really foundational to people's well-being. 
and it's part of what makes home ideally um, a sanctuary, somewhere we can relax, somewhere we can recuperate from the stresses of everyday life, somewhere where we um, don't have to worry about um, various conflicts and um, doing things at particular times or in particular ways um, that we have to. So I think autonomy and control over that immediate environment is a really, really um, important part of home. So, yeah, I think when we're thinking about ourselves and our loved ones, we know all that. We know that part of home is about building positive relationships and sustaining them, and it's about having control. But when we start to think about um, people who are homeless, especially um, single people, often men who are street homeless, I think we start to narrow our focus and think about physical shelter and the role of home in maintaining bodily integrity, health, and life. And that stuff is really, really, really important. But I think we can lose sight of the fact that actually, um, for those people as well, in my experience as a researcher, for you know, over a decade, they want just the same things that you and I want, control over their immediate environment, somewhere where they can forge positive relationships of their choosing. And yeah, I worry sometimes in the response to homelessness that we lose sight of that really rich, quite broad meaning of home. Mm. Thanks so much. And Yusuf, over to you. Um, I think uh, I'm going to start with Beth's, in fact, uh, key concepts and uh, autonomy and control. But what happens when it is a refugee camp? When these people belong to such places which have been there, and I'm talking here mainly about my personal experiences of such a places as a Palestinian who was born in a refugee camp in Lebanon. And how do I, for instance, view such a places as homes when we know that these places were constructed, were conceived of as places which are not meant to, to last for decades? I, I still, in fact, remember my, my mother's words when she used to go to these ration centers in, in the Dawi camp, my home camp. It's a Palestinian camp in, in North Lebanon. And for her, sustenance was home. To go to these UN-run ration centers was to maintain what is home. So this is something that I do believe belongs to, to the Arabic language, to how we view ourselves as Palestinians who speak a particular dialect. And the moment we exit these spaces, which are called camps, we realize that, in fact, we're being exposed to, to other dialects. And these people who are meant to be our neighbors are also strangers at the same time. In the Arabic tradition, for instance, the word bait, which is the equivalent of home and house, and of course it features in other Semitic languages such as Hebrew. It's not just living and life, it's also the tomb, it's death. It's where you die, where you're buried, and also where you maintain memory. So it is the speech that you speak, the words, the utterance, and also the structure itself. And that's why we have bait as a verse of poetry, and we have bait as a home. And I, I think that these are not just the experiences, but also the tropes that inform me about about the word home. I came to the UK as a refugee. Where is home for me? I gradually, I'm using the English language more often. Where is home for me? I gradually, I've started to dream, in fact, in the English language. How would I view the dissipation, the gradual, perhaps, dissipation of the Arabic language in my dreams? I think that this is, for me, it's a very complex but also existential feeling towards these things, language and people and places. Brilliant, thank you. Kara. Um, 
So I'm, um, I'm a philosopher and I don't have as much direct um, experience either personally or otherwise with um, people who have not, um, not had a home or had a very, uh, um, what would you call a refugee camp? Precarious home, maybe. So, uh, so as a philosopher, though, one thing I'm sort of disappointed in in, the, in philosophy is that there's very little done on, uh, very little philosophical work done on what is a home. We talk about, so there's some philosophy done on homelands and some philosophy done on, of course, a lot of philosophy done on nations and states and countrysides and things like that, but um, n hardly anything done on what is a home. And a home, I mean, for a philosopher, the home is an incredibly brilliant concept. I mean, what we love doing as philosophers is looking at interesting concepts or things or phenomena and trying to figure out what they are. And I can't believe that this incredibly interesting, very meaningful, thing that is in all of our lives, philosophers haven't <laughs> done much with. Um, so I mean, that's just an aside, and any of you who are philosophers out there, I really encourage you to get interested in this very fascinating topic. Um, the little that has been done, or at least that I've been able to find, has mostly been done by feminist philosophers, um, I, for maybe obvious reasons. Uh, a few strange male philosophers have said very strange things about it but but the, the the good the good work is done by um, has been done by feminist philosophers and uh, the really interesting thing about their work that I've, I've tried to survey a lot of it um, and I've looked at um, some writings that were back in the 19th century by um, uh, women activists and um, then all the way through the, the 20th and, and this century and they all say the same thing which I thought was really interesting and and I think it belies how universal our experience of a home is, and all of them are just what Beth said, right? So the list that you gave is really what the philosophers are repeating over and over again. It's that it's a located space. It's a place where we have our family, and of course family can be defined in very different ways, uh, but where we nurture our relationships with the people that we would consider to be our family. It's a place of rest and rejuvenation, of privacy, of safety, of memory creation, it's a place that is ruled by us, so there's a sense of we have control over that space, and it's also a place of storage, um, which you know might seem like it's not very important, but it's a really important part of our lives. So uh, one of the philosophers that I came across said, um, the home's capability to allocate space and time and resources over the long term is a legitimate matter for wonder. And if you think about your home space and the stuff that's in your home space, and especially if you've got a family and kids um, uh, and the stuff that's collected there and how you have to plan and manage, right, the stuff that's there and the amount of effort that's put into doing it according to the rules of your house, but also according to a sense of fairness, right, and the values of your family, it's just, it's an amazing, it's an amazing um, space. So. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll say three more things, right, that philosophers have come up with. So the thing, th those are a description of the home place. And the description's really also philosophically interesting because it always has both descriptive and normative <laughs> features. So descriptive is like you're just looking at a place and describing it, right, what is there. And normative means that we're describing what should be the case. Um, so we have these things like safety or autonomy. It's like we think that they're good because uh, they're, they're morally good for us. We are, our lives go better if they're there. We can judge a place as having more of it or less of it, but it should have more of it, right? So that's what I mean by normative. Um, and so for a home, a home has different roles that we think that it should play in our lives, and it does this in kind of unique ways. It makes it possible for us to develop personally, and emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, socially, politically. Right? These spaces are important. To transfer a sense of belonging, our self, our values, our beliefs to the people that live there with us. Right, so this goes back to um, the, the um, refugee camp. And um, to make possible our life outside of the home. So it's a, it's a disorder to only stay in your home, right? right? So we want our homes to be these really wonderful places that we want to leave, that's weird. You're supposed to leave your home, and you're supposed to, it's supposed to be this really wonderful place. So there's this really interesting feature of the home that you're, it's supposed to be so great that you leave it. 
Um, it prepares you to do stuff on the outside. I'll just say one other thing that's really interesting for philosophers. When, when I was getting interested in this topic, it was because I was looking at direct provision in Ireland. And um, direct provision is where Ireland houses the asylum seekers in Ireland. And uh, it, it comes in all sorts of different forms, but a lot of the forms is they're, they're put up in a kind of an institutional setting where the asylum seekers have rooms that are supposed to be safe, but they don't have any capability to cook their own meals. Those meals are provided for them. And the biggest complaint, right, of people feeling like they didn't have a home or criticizing what, what made them feel not at home is that they couldn't make their own food. And I, I, I just think that we, as philosophers, we don't think about why, why would that be the most important thing for these people? Why would that make them feel like they were not at home, right? Is because they couldn't make their own food. Um, and so it, I, I, I found it very challenging as a concept. Um, because it's not just about autonomy or uh, fairness or storage or, or, or safety or anything like that, but this other deeply human trait that we need to not stretch ourselves to engage with. Well, thank you all so much for getting us off to an excellent start with this really rich sense of what home might be. And it's very interesting to hear that we've got here both um, a sense of home as the kind of place that we live, as the place where we, we, we live with our families, the kind of smaller scale idea of home, but also we're thinking um, of something bigger, a camp, a country. Uh, we're thinking about both the structure, a place, but also about feelings. We, we all know what it's like to feel away from home or not to feel at home. Um, so I guess a question that I've got for all of you is, is it helpful for us to bunch all these things together like this, to, to bunch together our home as a structure, as a place that we live, potentially with our families and so on, with, for example, the notion of homeland or cities or these bigger scale things? And is it helpful for us to think both in terms of you know, location and feelings? Or would it be better, do you think, if we just sort of separated out those different ideas and focused on the importance of each? You're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like separating things out and thinking about them separately. So I'm, I'm a fan of that. But I, I, I think that you should keep a complete list of all the things that should be included at the end of your, your survey. So um, you know, if you want to think about the list of things that are home, and some of them are going to be, you know, it's about autonomy and privacy and safety, and some things are going to be about um, uh, uh, religion and values and, and language and food, right? And so I, I you probably, I, I think dealing with those separately mm -hmm. seems like you're going to be able to ar figure out what is important about each one of those in, in separate terms and be able to do it well if you think of them separately. But I don't think you should think of the home as just one of those things, but make sure that you're keeping the whole mm -hmm. list. Yeah, I, I share the inclination to want to separate things out into neat boxes and think about them all separately. But I do think at the end of that process, mm -hmm. as is clear, I think, from each of our contributions so far, there are really clear synergies and that can open up um, room for debate. I mean, I'm a social policy researcher. That's my job. So one really good reason to keep them separate is because the institutional policy context around uh, asylum seeking and refugee issues is completely different to that around uh, homelessness and it's completely different if you're a homeless family with British citizenship than if you're a single homeless male with no citizenship um, or if you're a woman in a home but homeless because you're at risk of violence um, or subject to violence in that home. So there are very important things to separate out about the law and about policy um, for each of those things. But I, th I think there are really important common themes coming out, which suggests maybe we shouldn't um, only separate things out, as you say. Um, and for me, uh, you know, this, this idea of control over one's environment, autonomy, and how sort of fundamental that is to well-being is kind of one of the things that seems important here and to be a thread through what we're saying. I, I don't think that these things should be viewed as separate, uh, as separate uh, matters and, and separate uh, components. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, I think a lot about what we um, 
or how we uh, talk about departure and leaving things behind and leaving home behind. And really, even for me, I've started to feel that maybe I have to reconfigure proximity and directionality, whether it's behind or in front, whether to the left or to the right. These aren't, I, I, how would we talk about home when the place itself as a camp is imposed on these communities? A choice is not there. Um, so these emotions and feelings and understandings of such spaces, of such, let's say, the way we had first the zinc groups and then evolved into concrete groups. And my father used to say that, in fact, structurally, these things weren't different. Perhaps we felt a bit warmer. But the spaces themselves, these homes, these structures, have always continued the same or to be the same because they are part of this space, mm -hmm. which is a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. A refugee camp that is supposed to be temporary and is not supposed to last forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, when another camp was demolished, and that was in 2007 in North Lebanon, Nahr al Barid camp, I still remember, in fact, some of our neighbors saying that now we have a concern. What would we do when other camps, for example, were to be demolished? Would we be able to take our dead with us if we were to leave? I mean, the question of life and death together, I think that this synergy, this connection is what maybe makes home as a notion continuously evolving. And in becoming, it's, it's, I don't know, even about tenses when I think about home, whether it's the past, mm -hmm. the present, I would say perhaps it has to do more with the future. Mm. Thank you. So I'm going to ask our panel in a moment to speak a little bit more about the importance of home uh, and its connection, for example, to our well-being. But before I do that, I wonder, do we have any questions from you about what we've heard so far and do pause while we wait for the mic here at the front we have a question hello hi um this is a very broad question uh but to set in the context of what you said i agree that you all describe home holistically as such a fundamentally important uh, thing for people's functional identity um if we look at the context of britain we are a very wealthy country in the world or described as a very wealthy country uh, but we're going through a massive housing crisis um, why are we going through this housing crisis and what does it say about our democ democracy mm, thank you so much and i'm going to take one more question while we're at it from the person with the hand up there thank you very much hi i want to ask about if there's a time dimension of a home. For instance, take this country for instance, a lot of Europeans that live in this country believe that after the referendum, they, be, they suddenly lost their home, you know, the feeling of being a home. In short, they might believe home is the pre-referendum UK. And indeed, I myself as a Hong Konger, I also have a feeling that a home is, uh, is different from a place that, is, that occupies the geographical time, time space of the current. If in the past, things were you know, all run in a different set of rules, whereas at the moment, things are going you know, in a different order, and you are only, your homeland becomes a place that, let's say, a place called the UK, a place called Hong Kong, which is different from UK, UK and Hong Kong. So what about this time dimension rather than the location? Thank you. Thank you very much. Two really interesting questions. So why on earth are we going through a housing crisis? Such a rich country, what does that say about us? And the relationship between home and time, fascinating. Beth, I'm going to start with you on the housing crisis question. Okay, yeah. Great question. Um, I'm going to answer it in a sort of fairly short-term sense, short-term meaning the last decade or so. 
Um, I think there was a housing crisis before that, and so there might be a there might be an interesting conversation to be had there. But one thing that is um, incontrovertibly the case is that it's got a whole lot worse over that time period, and we have you know uh, a list of statistics as long as you would like it to be demonstrating that whether you look at the number of people who go to their local authority to say I need help with a housing problem or I'm homeless, whether you look at the number of people in temporary accommodation because the state owes them an obligation to help them, whether you look at the number of people sleeping on the street and there are multiple different ways we measure that and they're all a bit tricky but if you look at all of them they show the exact same trend so I don't think, um, I don't think there's any doubt about that trend. Um, in England, um, before, before 2010, the number of people estimated to be sleeping rough on a snapshot night in the year was sitting at, I think, around 1,500. Um, that was the annual figure, a consistent estimate. And then we hit 2010, and it rocketed. And now it's over 4,500. Um, that's an underestimate, by the way. We know that's an underestimate, but it'll tell us something about the trend. So I'm going to answer the question in the sense of why has that happened? And I think the good news is we know. We absolutely know why that has happened. Um, and it's a confluence of a number of things. We haven't been building the right, the right homes in the right places. Um, the homes that we have been building or are available for people to access are too expensive, whether that's as owners or as renters. And Possibly even more important than some of that is what has happened to the welfare safety net. And it has been dismant dismantled since 2010. That has been a conscious choice that has a rationale, and I'm sure there's a really useful conversation, interesting conversation to have about the rationale for that and whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. We may think that it's been a good thing, but then I think we have to defend the effect of it. And that has been, you know, um, this massive increase in homelessness, whether defined widely and broadly or narrowly um, as rough sleeping. Um, so the welfare safety net used to provide for low income, uh, low income households, it used to cover the rent. And now it doesn't. There's a gap for almost everyone, especially in the south of England, but also in the north, um, between the help they can receive to pay their rent and what is owed. And the very obvious consequence of that is greater housing precarity and greater homelessness. Um, so I think alongside that, um, so changes to the welfare safety net, to what people are entitled to, um, has uh, been massively restricted. We've also seen cuts, I think and this, this is less part of the um, popular narrative maybe, but we've also seen massive cuts to local authority budgets. So um, what that has meant is that there is less money being spent on things like uh, welfare rights advice, making sure people are getting the, getting the benefits they are entitled to even if they're not enough, making sure they're getting all of them. And less money spent on, and actually since 2010, I think there's 70% less money spent on what in the field is known as supporting people type services. And what that means is housing related support. And what that means is um, people pay to go into the houses of people who struggle to budget, to pay the rent, to pay the electricity, to fill in a form for whatever reason, loads of reasons that might be the case. And that's an absolutely crucial homelessness prevention measure. It's an absolutely fundamental way of keeping people who are vulnerable in their homes and safe in their homes. Um, so I don't think it's surprising that with those kinds of services being cut, we've seen the effect we have. There is a positive there. The relationship is so clear and the trends are so clear that I think we know what, we, not what to do about it if we want to do something about it. So that's a sort of short-term answer to your question, I guess. Thank you. And Yusuf, can I turn to you about the question on the relationship between home and yeah. <coughs> this is, uh, I, um, I feel that this is, uh, um, it shows that our feelings uh, and, and these, uh, the times that we relate to, to feeling at home can be interrupted <coughs> and, and also can be, in fact, restructured and, and uh, uh, redesigned, I think. The, but what's uh, quite interesting about about time the, is how we tend to overlook when we speak about feeling at home. We tend to to overlook such such ruptures that are created by certain institutions, and and we tend to to perhaps at times view them as a transient. But in fact, they go beyond that. 
I think that that's why this notion of home has to do mainly with the individual perception of, of such a connection with these uh, places and, and also having such affinities or the lack of such affinities with these places. Mm. Thank you. Well, I think we'll segue straight into the next question, which is going to Kara, and that's about the relationship between <coughs> home and well-being. So, you know, why is home so important for human well-being, and what are the implications of that for homelessness and displacement, migration? Um, so I, it, it, like I said before, I like to compartmentalize things. So I have an I, I, I feel like I have um, an idea about one way the home is important for our well-being, and it has to do with the kind of um, creation activity that happens inside of the home. Mm -hmm. So um, just to... Just, just to mention one debate that happens in the literature. So it's not, not the case that everybody thinks that the home is really great um, and that we all want a home. There's actually a, it's a, a, some very sophisticated and I think um, important arguments to think about that argue that the home is uh, not a good thing to have in our lives. And that's a sense that it, it makes us too comfortable. It makes us long for something that is static Right, this kind of sense of, of ourselves or who, who we think that we should be that's just kind of it's, uh, solidified there in the structures of the home. And um, because of that static sense of identity and who we are, then uh, we create a barrier between ourselves and others um, that makes us very hard for us to engage in uh, making new, new connections that help us to understand other people, other other people who um, aren't like us, other people with other beliefs, other people uh, with other ideas of, of, you know, whatever, right? So, so this sense of this this kind of static, um, exclusive sense of the home is one that is is um, argued to at least be problematic, right? So, uh, a, a very influential feminist um, philosopher. I should, I, and political philosopher, uh, she, she did a philosophy of a lot of things, um, Iris Marion Young argued a, against this idea of the home as being static by saying that it's, it's a place that is uh, always having to be managed, right? So the homemaking activities of the home are partially what constitute the home. And that's done through, um, like I was, I mentioned before, and, and Beth mentioned, and Yusuf mentioned, the way that we well, we gather things in the home and then arrange them in certain ways, mm -hmm. and we do that so that we transfer um, what we want for other people in the home to believe and what values we want them to have, what their conceptions of fairness, their conceptions of, of religion, of, of how they ought to treat each other. Right? We do a lot of that through just the way that we arrange things in our home and allocate certain kinds of tasks in the home or spaces or resources to certain people rather than others. And um, one way that, one tool that philosophy has developed to, um, to capture that way of interacting with the home is by uh, thinking of it as an extended mind. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the extended mind just means that processes that we normal, normally think of as functioning inside of our head, we actually use external things to do that. So if you write down a note to yourself on a piece of paper, um, or you do a long, you add a lot of numbers together on a piece of paper, you could add those numbers in your head. I mean, I couldn't, I need paper. But you know, some people could do it in your head, other people need the, the piece of paper, but the function is exactly the same. So you're using something in the external world as parts of your brain. And there are different elements of our agency that I think are actually um, embedded in the home. So we use our home like we use, like we use our, our mind, right? So the home actually ends up being this, this extended, literally extended parts of ourselves. And so we use it for uh, storing our memories um, and transferring those memories and beliefs to other people in the home. Uh, we use it in order to think about what our beliefs are. So if you um, are wondering about what, you know, your, 
the way that you've allocated certain resources to certain people in the family and other resources to other, and you might rethink about whether or not that's a good value system or that's fair. Um, you, can, you can start to evaluate those values by actually moving things around in your home or changing some of the rules in your home. So it helps us, like an app, like you know how you do math on an abacus, you're moving things around, you're moving things around in the home in order to reason, in order to think um, about your beliefs. And then the other way that it helps you is by, which I, this is the funnest part of this idea, I think, is by, it actually helps you act in accordance with your beliefs. So you arrange your home in ways that make, uh, that make it the case, hopefully, <laughs> if you've done it right, that, that so that you um, act in the way that you would like to act, right? Uh, so if you would like to um, eat healthy uh, and go on a diet, what's the first thing you do? You get, you get rid of the junk food, right, in your house. Um, you don't just sit there and think, I want to go on a diet. Well, you actually physically change your house. Um, if you, if you want to make sure that you get up and uh, go for a run in the morning, then you put your running shoes right in front of the door. Uh, if you want to make sure that your kids come home and the first thing they do is sit down and do their homework, you make sure that the table is clean, right? So there are all these ways that you arrange your house um, in order to either block things, right? You know, put the candy way up high or the alcohol way up high or something like that, too. So you, you block, you make it hard for yourself to um, do things that you don't want yourself to do or, uh, or your family to do or, or the opposite. So the home acts in this extended um, facilitative way so for our, for our, uh, our, our, you know, just to be ourselves, right? Um, and then the idea is that if we don't have these stable, secure places in order to do that or if we have to move, Right, or if we're worried that if we have a, a precarious structure, we're worried that we're going to be moved, um, or our, our space is not under our control, then it can't serve these functions for us. So if if somebody comes into your house every day and rearranges everything, right, then it can't serve these kinds of important uh, functions for us. And um, and 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 I mean then. There's, there's different sorts of medical studies that say that this increases our stress and we're more likely, likely to get sick and, and, you know, things like that. But that's the, that's the idea. Thank you so much. And I should add that Kara has a brilliant paper on just this subject called The Wrong of Displacement in the Journal of Political Philosophy. So if you're interested in following up on that relationship between the home and the extended mind, then do check it out. Over to you, Beth. Okay, so I guess the clearest, most obvious, much less insightful than everything you just said, <laughs> manifestation of the relationship between home and well-being is street homelessness, right? And I think this is important enough to say, even though it's really obvious, um, and the enormous damage to people's well-being that goes alongside that experience, right? And I'm sure you will know this, um, but people who sleep rough are, you know, in um, danger in a way that the rest of us happily are not of catching infectious diseases, all sorts of other um, health issues. Um, there has been a lot of recent attention, increasing attention to deaths on the street. Um, so homelessness, lack of home actually being a risk to life at the most basic, at the most basic level, um, early mortality. Um, and I think very important to say also risk of violence and harassment on the street. So. There's a very, very clear example of the links between um, the importance of home and uh, well-being. Um, so I think as a society, if we're interested in well-being, which I think is a concept about as interesting as home in its own right, um, I think we could do a lot worse than starting to focus on that, um, on that, that group of people. They're, they're a, we can enumerate them, we can find them, and we know an awful lot about what works in helping them um, get off the street and stay off the street. Um, and actually in preventing it happen in the first place. So maybe we can talk a bit more about those resp responses later on. Um, but something I spend a lot of time thinking about is I guess like the next stage, if you like, so um, where people maybe aren't street homeless, but they're caught up in the homelessness system, if I can put it like that. So they're in that set of services, that set of policy responses and interventions that are trying to address this issue. Um, and I'm really interested in how we, um, how those responses fall really, really short of achieving any kind of rich idea of well-being for those people. So if you ask um, most people, 
maybe not you guys, I don't know, but um, this research has been done recently. Stand on the street, Vox Pop style, ask people, you know, what would help? What would help with homelessness, street homelessness? What a lot of people say is, well, we need more night shelters and we need more hostels. Um, and indeed in the UK, uh, as, in, as in a lot of other places, the kind of major response to homelessness, especially for single people, it's a bit different if you're a family, um, is uh, hostels or supported accommodation. So this looks like um, a room, maybe en suite, maybe not, in, um, in a sort of congregate, semi-institutional environment with other people in similar situations, likely with support needs. And these can be small, 10 to 12 people, or they can be really big. 60. In the old days, um, they used to be really big. Glasgow used to have hostels that accommodated, you know, about 400 um, people, but they've, they've been closed down. Um, so I think one of the key things I've sort of taken away from doing research in this area um, is the extent to which uh, living a fulfilled, fulfilling life of any kind of minimally decent um, quality is impossible in that kind of environment. And yet this is the environment that is meant to be supportive that is meant to be part of the answer um, to this problem. So I just wanted to say a little bit about um, why something that maybe many of us could take for granted as a, as a part of a societal response, a good response, is actually really, really, really problematic. Um, so part of this is about relationships. So home is somewhere where you forge good relationships. So if, if you're a single person, you're homeless, perhaps this is the end of quite a difficult story for you, potentially even starting in childhood. We know that a lot of people experiencing um, extreme forms of homelessness have had very difficult childhoods, and you find yourself in a situation with a lot of other people with the same experiences and the same support needs, potentially mental health problems, potentially for some addiction issues. Um, I think there's a really clear sense in which relationships have got off on a bad footing already. You know, you're surrounded by people struggling with similar things. Um, but I think it's also um, difficult to maintain other um, positive relationships with people outside of um, that group, outside of the other people you're living with. And part of the reason for that is, I think, stigma. And that's something we hear really often. You know, I don't, actually, my family don't know that I'm staying here because I'm, you know, too, too embarrassed to tell them. So I don't, I don't really mention that to them. And then there are kind of... Um, policy-based reasons why, um, why this kind of accommodation makes positive relationships difficult. So some research I did um, in Scotland a year or so ago, uh, I spoke to a number of men, and it, and it was men, um, who had access rights to their children. They had good relationships with their children. One in particular um, had 50% custody, but he had been accommodated in a hostel and no children were allowed for obvious reasons. There was no communal space in which he could hang out with his family. Um, another man explained to me that when he was living in a hostel, he would um, go and sit in, in you know, his, his family's car and share a packet of crisps and listen to the radio. That was the only really space they had to um, reconnect. And he'd moved into his own home and the mass, you know, he spoke in an extraordinarily powerful way about how wonderful it was for him to be able to have someone upstairs in the sitting room and watch TV with them kind of thing. And um, so I think, I think um, the relationships are a really important part of that. The other thing I think is the lack of autonomy, and we've, we've touched on this already, that people have in this kind of institutional environment. So um, key ways in which people's autonomy and control over their environment are restricted in this kind of accommodation. Um, when people can have visitors, um, where they can have visitors in their room or in a communal area, um, whether people can have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. So um, a guy I spoke to who was in a hostel in Dundee said, oh, you know, I've been, I've been living in this hostel for about a year and a half and I've, you know, I've, met, I've met some girls and I've tried to have a girlfriend, but it's just too much hassle. You know, they're not, I'm not allowed to stay away from the hostel for a night. She's not allowed to come in. And just how profound that is that your situation of housing exclusion means you literally can't have a relationship. It's quite, quite a kind of sobering moment. For me, then really banal things, when people could eat, what they could eat, how much they could eat. Um, you know, I told the chef, because so, some, some hostels are catered, some aren't, that I didn't like tuna, and it was, well, okay, you can have this. Well, I don't, I'm allergic to that. Well, you know, go sing. That's it. Mm. Um, a really horrible example was, oh, someone spat in my food and I went back to the chef and asked for another one and I was told I couldn't have one. It's a particularly kind of dystopian um, mm. example. Um, the idea of waking up early in the morning and the communal kitchen being locked, so not being able to have that. And I know these are really specific examples, but for me there were so many of them. They added up to this 
um, picture of just how massively constrained people's lives were and the day-to-day -day tiny things that make you feel human and make you feel like you have some control over your life just really weren't available to people in those environments. Um, so that led me to ask the question, you know, who benefits from these, who benefits from these rules and also what's the alternative? So I think who benefits is an important question for the, for the services, often charities um, running these organisations and I think it's very important that, that questions are asked about whose interests they're serving and whether there's a way of organising that kind of environment that can be more beneficial for the people living in them and prioritising those needs over, you know, the staff maybe. But I think there's a really important sense in which these issues are intrinsic to congregate living, right? You, because <coughs> you have people, um, you know, potentially with different support needs and problematic life experiences living together in one place, um, all on top of each other, you have to have those rules, right? So what's the alternative? Well, very happily, I think, um, there is an increasing movement um, saying people who experience homelessness or are excluded from housing shouldn't have to navigate this step, basically. Um, so people talk now about rapid rehousing um, and housing first. Housing first is a, is a really interesting example. Maybe we can talk about it later. But the, the key to those ideas is basically skipping out congregate living, night shelters, hostels that sort of characterise that response to homelessness. And I think, um, I think that's really important and I think it speaks a lot to the value of home that we've been um, talking about in this um, <coughs> session. I think, you know, partly why that some of that's so important is because home is somewhere where we can kind of, <coughs> we were talking about this earlier, be sort of um, complacent and stop thinking, stop making an effort in a way and you, you, you referred to some feminist scholarship that sort of critiques that idea and wants us to break down the boundaries of home and always be uncomfortable and always be striving. And I, I think, God, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the people I meet in these situations, when they finally get into a position where they've got a front door which they can shut and lock other people out, the unbelievable value of that, um, yeah, it just, um, yeah, I think it's really important to, re to remember that kind of thing. Um, so I, th I suppose one... Just sort of closing thing I want to say on a, on a slightly different tack is, of course, that home can be a horrendous place, mm. right? Um, and it's probably important to bring that into this um, conversation. It's somewhere where people can be can be trapped and subject to violence and unable to escape, and it can be extremely precarious because of, you know, how they do or don't own or rent that place, and you know, they could have a rogue landlord, and it can be too expensive, and you know. So I think um, there's really important stuff to talk about in that territory as well. But most of my most of my time and most of my work um, really does bring home the massive importance of home for well-being. And I think there is a challenge there in terms of our responses to homelessness and whether we're really living up, whether we've got high enough aspirations um, for people who are in this situation, really. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, uh, I, I have to say that I still do not, uh, do not know what well-being in the English language means. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, sometimes I feel that there are perhaps well and unwell places. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I have to, to, to return to, to the camps uh, again. I, there was a woman in, in our home camp and this woman was, in fact, a teenager when she was forced out of her home, her place in Palestine. And for roughly five years, she would beg taxi drivers outside the camp and ask them. And of course, she didn't know because she became senile that she was in a camp that she was in a refugee camp and no longer in Haifa, no longer in what used to be Palestine. And she would beg them to take her back to Haifa so she knew that she wasn't in her place. She wasn't in her home until, of course, the day she died. Another thing that, in fact, of late, I started to think about such responses because my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, used to hallucinate about his village. It's not easy to talk about wellness and well-being when you're eternally dispossessed 
when you cannot return to your place. When you view such areas as home and you feel that now there is this disjuncture and you can't in fact jump over it and it's over. But there is also, I would say, some wellness in, in the camp. When we see, sadly, very tragic circumstances, when we see other refugee groups arriving in, for instance, my home camp, Badawi, and starting a life there, starting from scratch, and then, of course, start viewing this place as their home, and at times renaming certain areas in this camp after their cities and villages in Syria or in Iraq. And of course, things are not ideal, but we have to remember when refugees meet other displaced people and they share these very limited resources, of course, things are awful at times and very hostile. But I think that there I can see a bit of wellness and this sense of solidarity with time and the notion of home. As in feel settled, the place is awful, but at least we share these things. And I think that this is how I view perhaps well-being and wellness is to survive but to survive in the circumstances. Mm -hmm. wow. So it sounds to me like what we have here actually is, is a good argument in favor of maintaining this more holistic idea of home because that helps us to capture something important about the way in which we need um, homes in our lives, about the way in which um, home is central to something like a good or even just a decent human life. Well, um, before we go on to our next section, please let me open up again to you if we have any questions. I've seen two hands shoot up here, so we've got one right at the back. Yeah, yeah, there. And then we'll come forward. Hello. I was just wondering how you all think of prison in the light of home, especially as you were talking about kind of poor homes being places where you feel trapped um, and you don't feel that sense of security. How much is kind of the state's policy of increasing imprisonment a way of actually taking homes away from people? Thank you. And here. Thanks very much try to formulate a question I'm going <laughs> to attempt. Um, do you think there is a correlation um, between this imposed post-industrial post individuality and the lack of community and lack of maybe family focus and then that causing that stigma? Because I know there's, there was a word stigma mentioned and for myself, someone who's not from the UK, um, I can't even, I can't imagine not being able to tell my parents or my family that I'm living on the street. For me, it's just an unimaginable thing. So is that relationship with the family, would that, would you think that would be coming from that imposed and encouraged individual thinking? Thank you. And I'll take a third question before we finish, just here at the front. Thank you. I think we need to appreciate how confrontational we are in this country about our homes. The classic statement is, of course, that an Englishman's home is his castle, and you cannot get more confrontational than to describe something in terms of a military defensive establishment. Mm. Through history, we have had this. Jane Austen shows how Houses, homes are protected by a load of lawyers scrabbling with ridiculously complicated fit arrangements designed to keep properties within a family and in the hands of the family members who are trustworthy and, of course, are not therefore black sheep or women. 
that's the basis we are. It is getting worse all the time because higher densities require sharing. If you live in a flat, you're sharing the roof. And that's pretty important. It needs arrangements for it. Arrangements which set out who does what and has people to manage them. But we have got really lousy ones in place which don't do the job and are allowing people to be exploited. And property litigation is quite frightening, the amount that goes on through the housing tribunals. Well, we need a radical change to the approach. We should get rid of the confrontational and impose, the government should impose through statute, an obligation to respect the, your sharers, whether they are the landlord or whether they are the neighbours who are together. There is some good litigation on this. Look at the Party Wall, Walls Act. Mm. That tries to get a, a mutual system in place, but we cannot get round to applying it comprehensively mm. to property. Thank you very and much. It's so bad that that is what we have got to do, and it's no good looking on the tree and I put in, put in bits of decoration in different places. It <coughs> is really fundamental. Thank you very much. So three really interesting questions again. So we've got the question about prisons and home, and I have to confess, Beth, when you were talking about um, some kind of living arrangements, um, that the thought of prison came to mind there, sort of enforced communal living and certain forms of, you know, kitchens locked at a certain time, that kind of thing. So I thought the prison question was, was very interesting and links very nicely to this question about, you know, well, we have a conception of home that's also about building walls, pulling up the drawbridge, being isolated and separate from one another, and that can be quite confrontational in its way. And then also the, the, the very interesting question about the relationship between um, homelessness and stigma and having a sense of community and social relationships you know is there a way of protecting people from falling into that sense that um, you know they can't tell anybody about their situation and so on so who wants to kick us off with one or two or even three of those questions yeah <laughs> sure. sure I'm still deciding which one um, well, y you won't get any objection from me about um, drawing the provocative and extreme, maybe, um, but I think interesting parallel between sort of institutional environments, like a hostel and, and a prison. Probably important to say that, you know, a lot of the charities and organisations running um, these services have, you know, the best of intentions, but I think what we have to look at is how people experience, experience them, and we've got so much evidence about how problematic they are. I think we really have to... Um, grab that bull by its horns and, and deal with it. So I've done no research myself personally um, on the theme of sort of home in prison. So I think I have a kind of naive, maybe informed by my research in, in other institutional environments view of, you know, how could you possibly um, have any kind of feeling of home or well-being related to home um, in um, a prison. I think just linking to something that you said, Yusuf, people do find um, ways of uh, coping and finding um, nuggets of positivity in very, very challenging circumstances, which I'm sure happens there too. But I, I, I really like the framing of your question. Um, and I don't have anything more insightful to say about it, but I wonder if other people do. Um, on this issue of family and stigma, yeah, I think this is important. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to go on a quick digression and hope come back to your question. So, um, I live in Edinburgh and um, we have the Edinburgh Book Festival and Rory Stewart, um, Conservative Party leader candidate, um, came uh, after, he, after he lost that um, contest to speak at the Book Festival and he had been on this tour, I don't know if you guys are aware, of the country and speaking to various people and he'd been in Glasgow the day before talking to um, addiction and homelessness services. Um, and he came to Edinburgh and spoke in front of an Edinburgh Book Festival um, uh, audience about, about those issues. And he said, what I, this is him speaking, um, what I found really 
um, difficult was getting to the bottom of these issues when I was speaking to service providers, when I was speaking to the people working with those who are homeless and have addiction issues on the streets of Glasgow. And where I really found I finally got an insight was when I was speaking to the person standing in the shop doorway begging personally. And what that man told me was that he had, um, you know, seven brothers and sisters in Glasgow um, and a large family, and yet he was still standing here with addiction issues in the in the supermarket doorway and I think we really have to ask ourselves this is still Rory um, uh, you know how someone can fall through the cracks of family like that and he voiced frustration with the people working in services who wanted to talk to him about poverty and austerity and how these things have driven homelessness right okay so I was sitting there slight, slightly fuming in the background thinking, oh my goodness, this is, this, you know, this is really, really tricky because, well, actually it's not tricky because what, what we know so, so well, and some colleagues of mine have written an absolutely brilliant article bringing to bear a whole range of quantitative evidence showing so, so clearly that it is indeed poverty and a lack of services that drives homelessness. And that, that man with that large family in Glasgow I don't know that man, I've never met that man, but I have met a million like him, and I bet that his family struggled with poverty for reasons linked to the structural context um, they were living in, um, and I bet that there were, you know, some issues in, in his childhood linked to that poverty um, that made his life really, really difficult from, from the get-go. So the idea somehow that this was just a question about how we can make family bonds come together and, um, and avoid these kind of issues was just such a such a misstep to me. Um, so I think the family is really important and relationship breakdown within the family has been a key cause of homelessness, like historically. Um, but I think we have to keep an eye on the bigger picture stuff, the structural stuff about poverty and house prices and income and the labor market and the welfare safety net because they're things that we really actually can get a grip on in terms of policy levers. What's happening in a sociological sense about you know relationships within the family and smaller household sizes, you know, that's a bit harder to... Um, yeah, so I think the family's important, but, um, but I worry that there's danger um, that way as well. Yeah, and a very quick comment on your question. As, a, as someone who lives on the top floor of a Scottish tenement and is a, um, therefore collectively responsible for the upkeep and the, and the roof of the building, I, I agree that these are really important issues. I guess my only insight from the sort of housing studies area is that there are loads, internationally, there are some really interesting different ways of dealing with this legally. And some of them work a lot well than others. I think the leasehold in England works particularly badly, for example. Um, the, t the tenement freehold structure in Scotland is pretty challenging too. It used to work better than it does now. I think um, Australia uh, strata rights, they have a system there that seems to work better in um, <coughs> balancing these issues and these conflicts in shared living. So I think there's some lessons there from um, you know, other places internationally, maybe. Thank you, and Kara, can I come to you to respond to any of those questions? Uh, yeah, so I, I think that the issue of uh, prisons is really interesting, and also, again, I mean, I, I guess I keep on just making an appeal to any budding philosophers or actual or, or full, full, fully formed philosophers out there <laughs> um, to to think more about the home. And one reason is because of issues like the prison. So for example, one thing that we used to do in prisons but we don't do anymore is um, put people in extended solitary confinement. And that's because we realized that this was like a, a kind of very intense torture for people that it did break down their psyche. And I think that if we understood better how the home features in our um, in our, our sense of personhood and our sense of of, of, of just mental well-being um, and and other ways that we are able to be a, a, like a fully functional person, um, that if we understood that more, how space and and place plays those roles, then we would have better uh, all sorts of better environments, including prison environments. So, for example, in a prison. Um, you, I mean, I think that we would probably want for the prisoner to be able to have some sort of sense of security uh, and um, stability in 
the way that they were able to arrange their room. So if they arrange, you know, the little bits of things that they have in their room, well, first of all, to be able to have bits of things that are their own, right? And to be able to arrange them in their room in the way that they, um, that fits them, right? That serves their extended mind, right? Whatever their, that serves their person. Um, and that they will stay there, right? That they won't be interfered with. I think that that's probably just a simple thing that uh, is, is essential for feeling like you're yourself and you have control over yourself and you're not just, you know, um, kind of constantly being beaten down. Uh, and there might, there might be ways that that would feature into that person's then ability to function after they're released from prison. And it just, just, you know, ideas for, for further study. Um, it, but there are similar, I just want to mention this, there are similar kinds of studies done in uh, not, unfortunately, not dissimilar environment, which is, um, uh, places where older people are cared for. So in America, we call them like old person's homes. I forget what they're called here. But uh, the, the same kind of situation ends up affecting these people where they uh, may have problems with dementia or other sorts of issues. And uh, they just keep on getting worse and worse. And part of the problem is they can't, they, they don't have any control over their space. They can't keep even pictures of their loved ones around them without them being interfered with. And it messes with their uh, uh, th their their mental capacities, um, and and we can see a, a medical decline. So, thank you. Well, I'm going to move on to Yusuf now, and to our third um, and final part of the evening. Can we discuss this question of how we should or could respond more effectively, more appropriately than? to the importance of home in our lives. For example, do we need new ideas, new priorities, new policies? Um, so, you know, should we be thinking in terms of additional rights, human rights, and so on? Could you get us started with that? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I can't offer policies, and I can't also give solutions. What I can do is simply to um, to respond um, as somebody who again writes and thinks and, and, uh, um, and goes regularly to, to the refugee camps um, to see family and to stay with them and also to do a bit of work what I've perhaps, uh, and this is, uh, it's uh, new to me, is how I've learned to, to listen to, in particular to my mother, because my, my father is, is very, has always been vocal and talkative, um, and to see thinks uh, through, uh, really, and this is not, in fact, poetic, but to see the understanding or the notion of home through her eyes, and at times to borrow her eyes as somebody who, who's, because uh, ration centers in the camps are very gendered, mainly women, refugee women, would go and carry these rations, some tomato paste, some flour, etc. And the men tend to, to belong to, to certain professions, but also from within the camp, or simply to be indoors as philosophers. Um, I, I do believe that these uh, trips to the, uh, to the uh, distribution centers, to these uh, places with my mother, and also reflecting on that, perhaps has given me the, the opportunity to see home as a sign of solidarity with history and fairness and, and also existence altogether. And, and to feel that you can, you can belong, but without allowing the sense of belonging 
to overwhelm your perception of the other and also not to see this as your territory but to see this as a place where ideas and thoughts and emotions can be deliberated and debated and shared and contested. I, so my perceptions are based on the, on the personal, mm -hmm. on what really I write about and how I am trying to, to write these homes, the camps, into literature and to perhaps say that I can look at these places, not only as somebody who was born as a refugee and now I'm a citizen in this country, but as somebody who can relate to such homes, to such places, and feel that they are not static places. And they are places where lots of good things are happening and taking place despite the circumstances. And this is my personal, perhaps, way of seeing home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wonder, before I move on, could I ask you to expand a little bit more on this, the notion of the temporary? Because you, you mentioned a couple of times the importance of the fact that camps weren't built to last. These are not places that are supposed to remain like that forever. So how does the temporary interact with notions of home? Is it, uh, is it deeply problematic for, for building homes that, there, that there's this kind of temporary shadow hanging over them? I, I, I think, uh, first of all, Palestinians in Lebanon, when we talk about, about rights, they can't, they can't own things. These are places, spaces leased by the United Nations Release and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees. They started with 50 years, now they've also paid for another 50 years. Um, Badawi camp, for instance, started as a camp in 1954 towards the end of 1954. And my father very proudly states that even in the camps, people talk about hierarchy and about authenticity, that they are the very first refugees mm -hmm. to arrive in this space. Mm -hmm. To the extent that when UNRWA rebuilt our house and they transformed it from zinc into concrete, my father insisted on keeping the old wall because he wanted this wall to stay with us. This, for him, this is how he still views history, that I came to this place and this is the wall that they erected for me and now it's my choice to keep it and I do not want them to destroy it. And it's uh, still a relic. And I've written about this wall. And it's there. And it's become a dear friend of mine came, for example, to visit from Harvard. And I showed her the ruin, the wall. This is the original wall. And it's the only wall. And so my father owns this wall. It's his also whom It's the way he he's attached to this temporality that has become in fact permanent. Mm -hmm. It's no longer, it's no longer impermanent. People know that they are going to be stuck there forever. Mm -hmm. And that's why in fact we are building our fifth cemetery. This is what they say, because cemeteries belong to the camps. And now other refugee groups are dying and being buried inside these uh, places. So you have different points of origins, different homes, in fact, engraved on the tombstones. For example, born in Damascus, died in Badawi camp, or born in Baghdad, lived in Damascus, died in Badawi camp. 
So these multiple homes are there, and they are, they are there to stay, sadly. Thank you, Kara. <laughs> Just sort of letting all that sink in. <laughs> um, uh, I, I guess I, I just want to stay on this issue of temporariness and permanence because it's a really, uh, I think it's an important issue to try and sort out what elements are um, kind of an important part that, that of thinking about why the home is plays an important role in our well-being, and then there are some elements that aren't. And maybe it doesn't, maybe, maybe you know, separating things out isn't a good strategy. Maybe we have to always think of things in much, the much wider um, context, historical kind of dynamic social context. So, so maybe, I don't know. But I was just, I was just in contrast. Um, when I started thinking about the home, and I, I was thinking of, of saying something like, well, what we really need is um, more policies against evictions from the home. So make it a lot harder to evict somebody from the home. And I got a lot of pushback from people that I work with, and especially, you know, like Americans uh, who are like, well, what's wrong with moving? Now, I'm a, I'm a normal American. I was just thinking back in, in, in how many times I moved when I was a kid. Americans are highly mobile. Right, you probably already know this. And uh, so I moved, when I was growing up a, a child, so before I turned 18, we moved four times. And I, that's really not a lot for an American. Maybe it seems like a lot for other people, but that was, that was not that was not a lot at all. So there's a sense in which it was perfectly normal and healthy for me to move, and I felt like I had a very fulfilling childhood, home life. I didn't feel like I was ever... Um, harmed in any way or my family was harmed because we moved, uh, at least from, from my own perspective, uh, that, that often. Um, and that's the normal experience for Americans. And in that context, saying something like eviction should be prohibited, they're like, well, what's, you know, of course we don't want the person to become homeless, but if they can move into another home, what's the problem, right? What's the problem with moving? Um, you know, twice a year, three times a year, or four times in 18 years or something like that. So I, I think that this is a really important issue. And um, I mean, I it seems like there's at least two things that are, maybe only one thing that's important is that you have some control over it, right? So being forced out seems to be much more harmful than choosing to move. Uh, and, and that kind of control comes in lots of different guys. So it could just be a literal eviction, you were just kicked out, but it could be some other, other kind of situation where you just, even though you're not moving, you just don't have control over your space. Um, so either you have a predatory landlord who is, I don't know, um, doing all sorts of sort of invasive things, or maybe you're in a situation where you have to share a space with three other families because you just can't afford it otherwise or something like that. But it's, it's, the, it's not having control, I think, that seems to be um, one. I'm sure there are lots of other issues <laughs> that make it, make it hard to move, um, but it seems like control is the main one. Thank you so much. So we're going to end at 8 o'clock, but before we do that, I'd like to let Beth answer this question, and then I'll open up again for a few more questions from you, and we'll have a final word each, and that will be it. So Beth, if, if you might answer in brief. I'll do my best. Uh, I want to say, maybe counterintuitively, that how we can better respond, the answer to that's really easy, I think, if we're talking about the sort of socio-political at the societal level. So I'll, I'll just tell you what I think the answer is. Um, we need the right kind of housing in the right kind of places with security of tenure mm -hmm. at a price that people even on a low income can afford. Mm -hmm. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. We need a welfare safety net that for people that can't work or are in low income work enables them to have a home that is secure, that enables them to pay that rent. That doesn't mean that private landlords don't want to accommodate that group. 
Um, and we need local authorities and support services to be funded at a level where people who will always struggle to manage their own home don't have to be homeless, okay? Um, we need to fund evidence-based uh, interventions like Housing First, which instead of requiring people to navigate a very complex staircase of services, first the night shelter, then the hostel, abide by all the rules, engage with the support plan, pass all the tests, and then maybe in the distant, near, you know, in the distant future, in two or three years, we might possibly give you a house. Instead, you take that person and you give them a home and you wrap the support they need around them to keep them there. There is very good science in a number of international contexts saying that works, so we should do that. Okay, mm -hmm. so all that stuff's really easy. I think what's hard, <laughs> I think what's hard, and yes, no fault, uh, uh, ban no fault evictions. Scotland has done that. Landlords in Scotland cannot evict people um, for, no, for no reason. We, um, we can reduce uh, forced evictions from the private rented sector. We know how to do that legally. What's really difficult? I think it's um, the stuff that, I don't know, um, that often people in, in the context of homelessness think about on a day-to-day -day basis more. What do you do when you walk past someone on the street who's sleeping rough or begging? I think that's really, really difficult. The Pope doesn't think it is. The Pope thinks you should always give to someone who beg, I uh, who is begging. Um, I think it's a bit more tricky than that. I think we have to take seriously that giving money, especially in larger quantities, can have might have a really positive effect. It might it might mean someone can I don't know get a bed for the night or get a hot meal, um, but it might have a really negative effect. And I don't you know I think we should take seriously that question, right? I don't think there's a left right um, you know I don't think that's a left right issue. I don't think it's that mean people don't want to give. I think there's a real question there about what happens if on Christmas Eve you slip someone begging a fifty pound note. What happens? to that person and people that work in the area know that sometimes that has really really bad consequences um, for people um, do you ignore that person well that feels like a complete moral failing it feels like you're failing in a moral obligation to someone um, or, or, or at the very least less onerously that you're failing to help someone in need do you stop and talk to someone that human dignity that human contact I think that makes the person who stops feel a lot better I'm a little bit skeptical about its transformative impact on the person um, you know begging to be honest um, do you buy them some food? Well, maybe ask them first so you don't buy them a beef sandwich and they're actually a vegetarian. But again, maybe that's a lovely thing to do, but I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that's transformative. So, yeah, the policies are easy. It's walking through a London street that's hard. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to open up for one last round of questions, and it's going to be a bit quick this time. So I'm going to take a question here from the person in blue. Thank you. And I've neglected this side of the room. So after the person in blue, I'm going to go over there to the person in the glasses. And then the person in yellow. And then we're done, I'm afraid. Um, so I've got a question. If we take into account Foucault's, uh, this is quite philosophical, uh, Foucault's fear of discipline, surveillance, and control, do you believe that the house is an escape from that? Or is it just another system in which this is implemented? Thank you very much. And then we'll have over here and over there, and if we can keep them quite short. Um, so I'll try to keep it quite short. So we've been talking about the home, and one of the attributes of the home that a lot of you have spoken about most is excluding others. So we can see this in the political discourse, especially on the far right, with people saying, oh, you know, immigrants now, there's not enough white people, I don't feel at home anymore. Right? This is something that is constantly coming up in a lot of parties. So do you think that, firstly, we should differentiate the home on a private level where my myopic self-interest to be alone, which, which there's, there was something said about here that people feel at home when they lock the door and when others can't come in. So is, well, firstly, this is actually a good thing. Uh, but secondly, should we differentiate the home as a private thing, as a space where I feel good from the home, which has been also talked about here as a country, as my nation, and the fact that the home is defined not by the fact that I belong here, but the fact that others do not belong here. And is it, is it possible to not to have a definition of home without excluding others from that definition? Thank you. Okay, so I kind of changed my question halfway, so sorry if it's not very structured, but um, I find it kind of curious about how, when we've been discussing these things, the main title, Right to Home, hasn't really been brought up. And so in response to mainly Beth's ideas about how we would reform the housing crisis, uh, I would perhaps sort of begin to question how we aim to possibly eradicate homelessness while we still have the existence of a housing market in which those things aren't necessarily mutually inclusive. 
And yeah, so how, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what I said. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm going to go start with Karen. We're going to have one minute each, and then I'll wrap up. Kara. Uh, I suppose I have to address the Foucault question. <laughs> um, I do. I do think you're 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 right about that. That's very insightful. That the home would be a place where there's rules and surveillance, but um, the that in the in the sense that we would have to come up with a way that that's uh, beneficial for the people inside of the home. So I do. There is a, a place of surveillance for my daughter. Right. You know, I am watching what she did too. To, letting her have her privacy to a certain extent, but there are better and worse ways to do that so the person becomes the kind of person that yeah, you want them to become. So it's a healthy home. Um, and I'll just mention briefly on the exclusivity. I This is one reason why I really would like for there to be a separation between the idea of the homeland and the home. I think it's very important to be able to say like, this is our place and you're not part of us, right? for the small home, right? But at, at a larger scale, I don't think it's that helpful to just say that our the homeland is just like the home and to just, just to transfer those feelings that we have for the home onto the homeland. I think it's much more complicated and maybe, and, and the, the analogy strains a lot, right? In very important ways so that I would, I would say you wouldn't be able to say that for a nation or a country. Thank you, Beth. Um, I think we can end homelessness with a housing market. I think that um, it's really important that actually we're really clear on that because the things we have to do aren't actually that radical. Well, they might be radical depending on your political hue, maybe, um, but they're actually not that radical. We, we reform um, private tenancy law to make eviction happen in the, in the kind of ways that you, that you spoke about. Um, we build the right kinds of housing. We fund the right kinds of interventions. And I think the, the proof of that, if you want proof, is in um, the very different, different levels of homelessness and trends in homelessness we see across different countries, even different parts of the same country across the UK, um, in places that all have housing markets, but they have different policies, they have different law, they have different tenancy rights, they have different numbers of people in social rented accommodation as opposed to home ownership and the private rented sector. So. I, th I think that's a message of hope. Um, I think it's really possible to end homelessness in that context. Um, on the idea of a right to a home, which you're right, we haven't talked about much. Um, I think the idea of, of, of housing as a right, housing as a human right, is really powerful and intuitive to a lot of people. And to the extent that it gets the outcomes that I care about and have been talking about this evening and it gets people off the street, I'm really delighted about that. I suppose to end on maybe a provocative note, I worry that the language of human rights um, alienates some people that we might be able to find common cause with, actually. I think it maybe creates divisions on policy debates where maybe there needn't be any. So I'm very keen that we try and build wide, robust coalitions to support sensible policies on housing and homelessness. And I wonder sometimes whether rights is the right language for that. Mm. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm just thinking about uh, the invocation of, of home in, in, um, in the institutional rhetoric and, and machinery. Um, we have the home office, we have homeland, uh, is it security in the States? Are they cool? Mm. Uh, I, and also in the Arabic, we have to remember that it, tradition, it's also the mosque. It welcomes and it shuns those who do not believe in this faith. So these are things that I, I think that's why emotions are incredibly important when we view attachment and to try to also materialize attachment to such places and see how, uh, for instance, the rigidity, in fact, there is something static about the home office because everything is delineated, everything is demarcated, whereas the personal, in fact, it transcends such boundaries. The personal has to do with our experiences of such places. And that's why there is a huge distinction between the emotional home, the home that in fact allows us to think about other people's presence and the home that conceals us from the presence of other people. And 
this is perhaps uh, a reflection on what you've just said. Thank you. Well, we have to let all of you go home. Um, so we're going to have to wrap up, but do come along next week to the forum. There's going to be a whole different discussion. It's going to be about ideas of where, where ideas of right and wrong come from with philosopher Philip Pettit, psychologist Zana Clay, and evolutionary anthropologist Simon Schnall. So please join me in thanking our fantastic panel, and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>